So next up, we have our last panel for today. I will be moderating this panel today, and the panel is Technology Leadership Around the Connected World. So joining me today are my panelists. If you could come up on stage. Uh, we have Nigel Walsh, Managing Director of Insurance at Google, John Somberg, Managing Partner at MSNAD Ventures, Rachel Olney, CEO at Geosite, and Dan Rosenthal, CRO and COO of Root. I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Uh, so Nigel Walsh, uh, MD for Insurance at Google Cloud. Uh, delighted to be here, my first time back at ITC with a year off for, uh, for last year. And uh, yeah, I'll tell you more about that later on. Hello everyone, Dan Rosenthal, the Chief Revenue and Operating Officer at Root. I'm Rachel Olney, I'm the founder and CEO of Geosite. I'm John Soberg, I'm a managing partner at MSNAD Ventures. Thanks guys. Um, one thing I noticed when I was reading your bios, you guys all had um, subject matter expertise in, in different fields before getting into insurance. And so uh, I'll, I'll, start with, um, I'll start with you, Dan, your specialty aviation and then getting into insurance. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, a mixed bag as you look back at my career, I suppose, uh, starting as an entrepreneur at the age of 12 with my own uh, online travel agency before the internet existed. My uh, IBM PC XT and, and my dial-up modem and being called ma'am by clients who called into my Tom Thomas Cook travel agency because my voice hadn't changed yet. So that's where my uh, entrepreneurial and aviation career started. And through there, it's been a mix. I was a lawyer, moved into aviation at NetJets, the private jet company on the business side, and then um, uh, started, uh, co-founded a business in aviation finance, Milestone Aviation. Nigel and I, Nigel and I were just talking about Dublin, uh, where that head company was headquartered, um, and then had the good fortune to join the board of Root and meet Alex Tim, the co-founder and CEO, and that's why I'm here today. Awesome. And you, Rachel, you, were a, an, you are an instructor for technology and security at Stanford University. Tell us how that pivot to insurance happened. Yeah, so it's been a, a little bit of a journey. So my technical background is all mechanical engineering. Um, and of course, at our company, we deal with a lot of different data providers. And you know, it helps with having a good grounded basis in the engineering and sensors and, and technology that we use. And that actually translated into me doing a ton in national security. Um, and so you know, I always like to say this is an extra fun panel because I get to give very direct on the spot credit to John for uh, <laughs> pulling us into insurance. So when we first started Geosite, our first customers were special operations. And you know, to this day, our company does search and rescue across the US. So there's a single team that triages over 11,000 search and rescue events in the continental US a year. And obviously, that requires a lot of different geospatial data and the ability to triage that data. And so that's really where our roots were. And we went through Y Combinator. And I remember we walked out after demo day. John walks up to me, and he's like, you need to get into insurance. <laughs> And uh, I remember telling him, like, that's nice. OK, um, we're very busy with our national security stuff. Uh, I'll let you know when we, when we have some extra cycles to consider it. Um, and you know, so since the very start, MSNAD has been an, an awesome partner. And that's really you know, how we made that turn into insurance. Um, but the time working in national security was dealing with a lot of regulation and bureaucracies and really large, large organizations that have a lot of hierarchy and procedure. And so so when folks asked what it was like getting into insurance, I was like, you know, it's not that different from government. Um, we, uh, we understand all of the different hoops that people have to jump through, all the different business units, and how complex that can be. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, my question for you, John, is, you know, I think when I asked for a bio description, you said you spent a lot of years in fintech even before it was a term, right? When did you see that shift from, you know, the traditional fintech and asset management into insure tech? So, um... I guess my background, I feel like I've had a few careers along the way, so it goes so many kind of different directions. It's hard to kind of pinpoint the way it went. But um, as an investor, I think, I, I don't know that I would say so much as a, of a shift as it feels like there's, there's waves that come in. And so when you, when you look at finance, when I was first investing, the, the big hype was mobile payments started in like, you know, I don't know, 
ten, more than 10 years ago. And that was the first thing. Everybody was talking about mobile payments and peer-to-peer -peer payments and things like that. And then as they moved past payments, they started to get into lending and things in that range. Then we started talking a little bit more about banking and a little infrastructure. Insurance has come kind of late, and I think a lot of it is because of the complexity and the regulatory frameworks in yeah. the industry. It's just harder, and it takes longer. Um, but yeah, I think FinTech came into vogue sort of around the time people started saying they were going to disrupt banks. <laughs> Nigel, my question for you is, one of my colleagues who's here, Todd K, said he said he found, um, or he saw one of your first posts on Twitter about InsureTech in 2016. And you've been hosting a podcast on InsureTech for five years. So, um, you know, maybe talk about how your, your interest really shifted into InsureTech around that time. Oh, well, it, it really is that long. Um, and actually, it's not hard because no one loves it. That's, that's my biggest issue. And your, your message to, to, to Rachel about you've got to be in insurance. No one wakes up and says, let's go into insurance unless we're related to someone that's got a, a broker or an agency or a parent that works in the industry. But no one gets out of bed. And very few go to college and come out and go, I'm going to be an actuary, or I'm going to be an underwriter, or a broker, or whatever else. And I've been involved in fintech for a while beforehand. Fintech merged into, what can we do in insurance? It's, let's go after the low-hanging fruit. I'd worked a lot with a company that was doing a podcast on fintech. And they said, let's start one on insurtech. And I remember the very first episode, David and myself got together and just, it was like a, a pub chat. And started talking about, what, what could we do in insurance? And ever since then, it's grown. There's a, there's a really decent volume. There's thousands of podcasts out there on insurance now. But I think we'll go back in waves. And that wave is now back to almost phase one of the, well, we've done all the easy stuff in insurance and insure tech. We can buy insurance on our cell phone in 30 seconds with a couple of clicks. All right, now we've really got to start turning our attention to the hard stuff. So um, it's definitely gone in cycles for me. And my mission always has been to make insurance more lovable. That's right, you did say that. There you, go. Um, you know, we can't talk about a connected world without bringing up data. It's been a common theme throughout the other panels as well, whether that's big data, uh, new data sources, or real-time data. And so my question is, I'll start with John here. Um, as someone who invests in InsureTech MGAs, how does your view on data impact your in investment approach? So I, we invest in a lot of things related to insurance, like. Rachel's company, which was not in insurance. Um, I think we, we always believe that at the end of the day, this is gonna sound like a really simple thesis, but if you're not good at data, you're not gonna survive. Um, now that, that's sort of the baseline. Then I think there's some companies that are, are just better, that, that really understand data better. I don't know that it's always proprietary data, for example. Um, in a lot of cases, it feels like it's, it's actually the ability to, to pull intelligence from data that's the key that we see. So we tend to look for people who are good at understanding the data that they have and then trying to pull the insights out that they need in order to help support their business. Um, we do find sometimes, you know, there's, there, there are drastic differences between those who have sort of data DNA within their company and those that don't. Um, so I think, but all that comes into play. When we look forward, I always tell people 10 years from now, do you think underwriting is gonna be done on paper? And do you think that it's gonna look the same? Do you think that you know, we're not gonna be looking at thousands of different data sources with, from everything to you know, climate, to health, to whatever else has impacts on the way we live our life? If you don't assume that, then, then I don't know what the, you know, I don't know what you're looking at in terms of an investment. Awesome. Um, you know, Rachel, your company specializes in geospatial data. Um, how is Geosite using data to help insurers stay ahead in this connected world? Um, I'm going to draw on something John said about if you're not drawing on thousands of different sources, you're not actually leveraging the best data out there. So when we first started Geosite, it was driven by, and I know it's they always say like a founder has to be a little crazy, right? About some problem that everyone else is like, why is that a thing you're obsessed with? But what I was obsessed with was how much absolutely brilliant geospatial data is out there. So when I say geospatial data, I mean satellites, I mean drones, aerial data, geospatial analytics companies, modeling companies, um, data that's collected on the ground but geograph geographically tied, or telematics data, or any of these sorts of things that have a geospatial component, there's this rich, 
amazing amount of data that's growing really rapidly. But the ability for people to take that immense amount of data and then plug it into specific use cases, and then on top of that, do that at scale within a really large, complex organization is this massive combinatorial problem where you have all these use cases, you have all these data sources. How do you triage it? How do you normalize it? How do you pull that in? How do you decide which one is best? Right? The interesting thing about geospatial data, as like trite as this might sound, is it's geographically tied and therefore it's geographically relevant, right? And so the algorithms you might run in one geography will be very different from what you run in another one. And the modeling company that might have the best flooding or climate data for one region may not be the same for the other. Or one that we see in insurance a lot is geocoding. So actually knowing where is the thing that you are insuring is a massive problem. And it's a prerequisite for using all of the amazing geospatial data. So I kind of joke to people sometimes, uh, geosite is really fancy geospatial plumbing. You know, we pull all this data, we do really amazing magical things to it, and then we plug it into people's core systems. And you know, that's part of why we're, we're here today, right, is the, the integration with Socotra now, um, where you know, customers of Socotra can use geospatial data from tons of different sources because we can triage those and plug it directly into the core platform, um, which is really exciting. And so it's, you know, I always have to tell people we're not a geospatial analytics company per se, not like a CAPE or TensorFlight or those kinds of things. Um, what we are is the recommendation engine and triaging um, platform. Awesome. I'm going to add to that, if I may, very quickly. I live and die by a phrase that is just because you can doesn't mean to say you should. So two examples, I think they build quite nicely in this. One was, it's about a decade ago, I was working with an insurer who will remain nameless, that was spending the best part of $100 million, this might ring true to many of you out there, on building a platform that could launch a new product every day. A new product every day. I see a smile in the audience here. It's not you, don't worry. Um, and the CEO turned around and said, why are we doing this? We don't launch products every day. So why are we actually spending all this money to do a capability that we don't actually need? So use case one, just be careful what we actually want. Use case two actually is our like usage-based insurance one, where they gave a brilliant app back to the end customer. They managed all their miles, they thought they were getting all the insights, it was a gigabyte of data coming in per trip. But because of the faults in their legacy core platform, it got converted from loads of data into a Excel spreadsheet at the time, and because the core platform could take three codes, it then got converted from all this data into a 5% discount, 10% discount, or 15% discount. So as a customer, I felt great. All this data is being used to track my driving and give me a better price. But they could have saved the fortune and said, here's 5% discount. So we've got to be able to do something with the data if we're going to go out and actually use it in the first place. Awesome. Thanks for that. But uh, that's a good segue to my, my question for you, Dan. Um, tell us how, about how Root is collecting data. Uh, well, <clears throat> I, I want to build off of uh, also what Rachel and Nigel said, but I'll talk a little bit about how we're collecting data using the mobile phone. And then it goes to your point of how you then harness the data and what we're doing with it from a data science and a customer perspective, which is what's so important at the end of the day. So we use hundreds of sensors on your mobile phone to evaluate how people drive. That's the magnetometer, the gyroscope, the accelerometer. Um, and then the question I get often is, OK, we hear about telematics a lot. What makes your telematics different? And that's where Rachel's point becomes so important, because it's not just getting the data. I completely agree with what you said, it becomes what you do with it. And for us, it's not only the power of the data, and we've collected a treasure trove of data, and people talk about billions of miles. That's not what matters. It's not only have we collected that data, but we then integrated it with hundreds of thousands of claims that our customers have experienced to understand what is working and not working within the data. What did we miss the first time around? What do we understand from it? It's that integration, that data science, that harnessing, that is what makes Roots Telematics so powerful. And it's the ability then to pivot back to the customer because customer doesn't necessarily understand if you're using synthetic data and then you come to the customer and say, oh, it looks, looks like you had an accident and the customer didn't have an accident, there's a mistake. Or it looks like this happened and it didn't happen. Or you turned left at the intersection where actually the data science will show you, you ended up turning right. Things like that, the customer loses confidence and credibility in the data that has been collected. And I think that's why Nigel's point is so important. 
Usage based insurance is just so misunderstood by the broad population, at least in America. And part of the reason for that is we have not simplified it. And I think the minute we can take these hundreds of phone sensors, these tags, these devices, uh, and what have you, and try and make sure we're producing an integrated experience that fits simply with what the customer expects and with the way they think they behave, I think it'll be more powerful. And that's what we're doing at Root. What's interesting is we started off as a B2C customer. We're very lucky to, or B2C business. We're very lucky to have all this data and all the data science and systems behind it. What's interesting now is other carriers are calling us and saying, are you interested in being a B2B company around your telematics? So we have started that now with one customer. We are looking at other opportunities from a B2B standpoint that it, as I was sitting here at ITC a year ago, we didn't consider necessarily. And as we're sitting here at ITC a year from now, we may be a very different company in that sense. Again, trying to keep simple, but also trying to respond to the market need. Thanks. Um, I want to on what you said about it, it, what, it matters what you do with that data. And so obviously you need tools to connect uh, these ecosystems to actually do something with that data. So I guess it's a question for the group and um, you know, what type of technologies do insurers need to leverage you know, a connected ecosystem when we talk about the data sources that you're needed for these new type of insurance products? And anybody can start. <laughs> I guess. Hello. I guess I can start. Um, I, I, it's. I was. You know. I, I would say I don't know what all the data is that we're going to need. Um, I'm. I'm a big fan of letting the data speak and trying to figure out the insights from it, and then learning that way as opposed to the other way around. I think you have to have a vision of the direction that you want to go. So I'll. I'll give you one example that that we're seeing a lot of. I think we're starting to see more and more health data and behavioral data go into different products than we would have seen before. So the telematics and driving for sure makes sense. But we're also starting to see people say for, you know, if I'm not feeling very well that day, my driving might not be as good. And how does that impact as well? So is there a health piece to this that could be interesting or could, you know, and you, you don't want to cross any lines, but um, we have another company, for example, that is, um, uses heartbeat data, and their, their core business is encouraging people to exercise, and by, by exercising, they, they get benefits. They're, they're, they have a credit card where your, bon your points are multiplied if you keep your exercise streak going. But the other thing now that they're able to do is they're able to underwrite life insurance just with a heartbeat. So if you start thinking about that as a platform of data from health and what kinds of products can you do and what can you do to reward people for healthy behavior, I think you change the way you think about insurance in the grand scheme of things. So that we get excited about those types of, of examples and, I, and it's also why I say I don't know for sure because usually smart people like the ones on stage here tell me and I'm the one who just has to try to say yes. If I, it's not an advert, but if I was going to be really honest, I'd say Google Cloud. I know I'm, I'm <laughs> fully biased, so you can all hit me afterwards for that. Um, but joking aside, I guess there's not a day that goes by inside our organization. I'm not amazed at some of the things that we come up with. We brought out uh, technology last week around using uh, AI to understand smells and lots more. I mean, it's just insane what we can do. So the technology capability, I think Einstein said years ago, was far beyond human um, demands and needs right now. But if I switch around again back to, back to your point, for me it's, we, we all too often are treating customers as products and we, we operate in product silos. Auto, home, life, health. I don't wake up and go auto, I don't wake up and go home or whatever else. I wake up and go, still hopefully, I'm still Nigel, what am I doing in my lifestyle? So you've got to layer all these things together and use the technology uh, from these individual silos and then anything you've got from th uh, third party or external sources to make that experience better. I know everything. Before I call my wife, I do find my to see if she's at home on the school run <laughs> or something else. Because I know if she's on the school run, she's not gonna pick up the phone for me. Yeah. So it's a good bit of insight to go, hey, Emma's driving, there's no point calling her, or she's gonna be with the kids in the car. So that level of insight is really good. And my phone learns that over time. It now says, hey, you've woken up, you've just got back to the apartment, uh, do you wanna do this next? It knows me. Why can't insurers do that? Why can't we be way more reactive 
and get this engaging, lovable experience as opposed to the fire and forget, you come back, you buy it once, you disappear for a year, and you never want to speak to them again. That's got to change, and that's where... Nigel, we can't even remember people's names when we do it, as a, as a, <laughs> you, you in do, terms say... of legacy carriers, because I take, take Costco as an example. You're a Costco member. They have all the information about you. You go to sign up for Costco insurance, what's your name? Dear first what's name. your Costco Dear number? Dear first name. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So let's start with that. We, we were talking with someone who uh, is in California with one of the large carriers. He has an auto policy and a motorcycle policy with the same carrier, not integrated. Two different logins. So guess what? Goes into the motorcycle uh, uh, policy to pay the bill, put in your credit card. Well, I did that before. It's things like that, I think, reinforce your point of, frankly, how far the industry has to go, but that's opportunity for so much of us in this room, and that's what we're focused on taking advantage of with our focus on embedded insurance. That's what it ties back to, is how can we make this simpler for the consumer so that they wake up with ease, like you go on Find My iPhone, really? Yeah. You use the Apple? <laughs> we're an open organization, you've got to be darn it. Wow, okay, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the thing that I would add is I actually kind of want to take kind of your original question and draw back to something that, that Nigel mentioned about just because you can, should you, with the data. I think one of the things we see over and over is there's so much that you can do with a platform like ours that integrates so many kinds of geospatial data. Um, I joke with our customers, let's play the game of what's easy, what's hard, and the game of what's valuable and what's not right, and you know, kind of create those quadrants, because there are certain things where, you know, to draw in those customers, it could be really valuable and not that hard. Like, can we send out alerts ahead of a, you know, major disaster and say, hey, policyholders, it looks like you're in the area that may flood based on these, you know, predictions, because, you know, we as a carrier now magically know where these policies are, and we have climate data and then be able to tell them, here are three steps you can take to help protect your home against this disaster, right? Which helps the carrier, helps them feel like, oh, wow, this insurance company really has my back. And then being able to respond to those quickly. And so that's like, you know, keeping them engaged, making them feel like it's value added, not just, oh, they're collecting more data to make my insurance more expensive, right? And actually pulling them into this process or post-catastrophe, being able to say, hey, here's this imagery of your property. It looks like it was damaged. We're, you know, paying out your claim right now so you can start booking hotels or doing those things. And so those are the things where it's like, this is totally feasible and a great idea. And then we end up with the other side of it. And this is to your talking about the watering down of the data as it goes through the process. We'll work with carriers that will say, I want to know how many, sh like, how many shingles on this roof are damaged. We're like, OK, that is totally feasible. Is that valuable, right, for what it's going to cost you? Absolutely not. And so. Are you sure? <laughs> Do you want to count them? Uh, it, it depends on the region. It depends on the data source. It gets very nuanced, right? And so it's, it's one of those things of like, there's all this rich data, but where is it valuable to spend a lot of money on really rich data? And where is it not? And how do you deal with those sorts of things? And then also loop that back to the customer so it's actually you know, creating that value add. I'm going to get jump in again. Maybe we're comfortable with evolution. Yeah. Maybe we're just happy plodding along slowly and letting the industry move bit by bit and not looking at revolution. So give you an example in the connected world, uh, AXA Fizzy, parametric insurance, every one of us has been on a flight, every one of us has got travel insurance, every one of us has been delayed. Of all those people, there's lots of smiles in the audience already, of every one of those people that's been delayed, I'd argue 80 to 90% didn't bother claiming on their travel insurance because it was too hard, too much of a faff, just didn't want to do it. In the parametric world, of course, and straight through claims and automated processing, that would happen automatically. But for the insurer, that falls back into my, just because we can, do I want to change my loss ratios automatically to build a better experience on travel? I could. Nah, let's not do that. So maybe we shouldn't do it all the time, but there are cases when this will just flip to being, actually, that's the expected norm and nothing more. In the same way that Root and UBI and everything else will become the default standard. It will be opt out, not opt in going forward. Right. Well, as technology leaders and experts, what are some other challenges insurers are facing today in the market? Maybe we'll start with you, John. Uh, I guess I would say the biggest challenge, I think, is the, the changing risk profile of our world these days. You know, if you look, his, uh, insurers basically and, and you know, actuarial 
approaches are looking at the past to predict the future. And realistically, that, that whole mechanism doesn't really hold water anymore. And you know, we could talk about flood, we could talk about fires, we could talk about whatever. Um, and it's not just natural catastrophe, it's cybersecurity, it's a lot of, it's health, there's a lot of things that are changing. So I think the ability to predict risk is getting harder and harder and harder every year. And it's making it more and more difficult for insurers. And then, you know, just the, the potential for massive losses is, is becoming bigger all the time. So I think that is, is, a, is probably the biggest challenge for insurers. And then it's also one of the biggest opportunities, but also a, a you know, huge challenge for insure tech. If anybody wants to go off of that, we can, or, we can go linearly. I wasn't yeah. sure we wanted to jump in next. I mean, since we're on catastrophe, that's uh, that's something we have lots of thoughts on, right? I mean, when we talk about geosite, you know, like we mentioned earlier, you know, insurance wasn't our first market, but now it's by far, you know, one of our most important markets. And the way that we explain that focus, and this is something, you know, I know, Nigel, you're at Google, but the other cloud providers also kind of, there's a lot of consensus. Sorry, I didn't hear what was that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, in the geospatial world, there's a lot of consensus that, you know, the insurance industry, even though, you know, it's still kind of, you know, in its baby steps of how do we implement these things, the insurance industry will have to be one of the first major industries to implement use of geospatial data at scale exactly because of the problems that, that John brought up. The models that people have used in the past just aren't performing as expected. The insurance you know, gap, it's all the buzzwords, right? The insurance gap is growing. People need to create new products. Um, they need new models. There needs to be you know, the frequency and severity of natural catastrophes is increasing. How do you make sure that you have the data both to prepare for that and you know, look forward for it and plan for it, but then also deal with the claims after a major catastrophe um, and handle that really well? And so for us, when we think about what are these big challenges, you know, I agree, I agree on the, the climate change piece is really key in making sure people have data to deal with that in all of the different parts of the, the policy life cycle, right? Because it's important at new product, you know, creating new products, as well as how do you are integrating all the data for something like parametric or these other newer things that rely on more nuanced data sources and then dealing with that customer experience and those claims afterwards, it actually touches every part of the organization. I, I'd just pick up on that. I think um, what John and Rachel just said is very important on the catastrophe homeowner side. We don't see as much of that, obviously, in personal auto. I, I think of the question as actually just the world we live today, things are getting more expensive for more cat risk. Things are getting more expensive for consumers. And so I think about it right now from the consumer interface. Nigel's right, not only do they want simplicity, but people are opening their monthly bills and saying, what happened? And going to the grocery store and saying, what happened? And I tend to think we're in the early innings of that still, as painful uh, as that seems. So I think that's going to have a real changing dynamic where, in the coming months, quarters, and, and even years, where inflation is kicking in at record levels. And the impact that that has downstream is significant. I mean, take a look at, at just as an example, auto insurance loss ratios. You've got top 10 carriers that had a 40% loss ratio a year ago that are in the 80s, heading up over 100. Root, which started five years ago, has a loss ratio that is better in the second quarter than three of the top 10 carriers. And because we were able to leverage technology to get ahead, we're driving that down further. You're going to continue to see loss ratio skyrocket, particularly for the legacy carriers that are slower to move. And that means you're going to see those price increases that they're pushing through be really significant and take a while to flow in. So the impact that that's going to have on the consumer in the next quarters and years around just auto insurance, I think is going to be really significant. And that'll, that'll take place in some of the other personal lines as well. Never so true. Living in New York, seeing what happened every single day I go to a store, is like, oh my god. Uh, mortgage rates hitting north of 6%. It's all about to hit us like a very big brick wall quite quickly, I think. So that's, that's quite worrying. Insurance is a resilient place to be, though. So insurance is actually a good place to be. My biggest concern or thing I'd like to change most about the insurance industry right now, I think, is agility and speed. Our, sp our speedboats, the startups that are here, that have been here for the last decade, are reaching scale, they're doing well, they've had people go, they'll never work, oh look, they're working, we'll sue them, let's acquire them. The whole cycle, right? Go read Tony Fidel's book called Build, he maps out perfectly. Um, but I think, we'll, I think the insure tech world will absolutely have its day 
because they're agile, nimble, and they can move fast. And if the larger organizations can't take that mindset, attract the right talent, or any of the other things, that for me is probably one of the biggest issues. Well, I don't want to hog all the questions to myself because I do feel like I have a very uh, interesting panel. Um, so I want to see if there are any questions um, from the crowd that you'd like to ask the panelists. Um, and Kim will be walking with uh, a microphone. If not, I will. Oh, there they have one. Hi guys, um, I think you might have touched on some of this already, but um, I think it bears repeating. You spoke a little bit at the start about um, how insurance has kind of tackled the easy stuff and that's how a lot of insure techs kind of start. From your perspectives now, like what are the hard things? Um, and I guess the second question would be, given that there seems to be a lot, how do you prioritize kind of which thing you tackle? I can start with this one. I think one of the, um, this goes back to earlier when I was talking about playing the game with our customers of what's easy and what's hard. Um, and we sit down with them and we basically say, okay, we get that there's a lot of different things, a lot of different innovation efforts, lots of internal programs, lots of different parts of the business that you know, they're trying to modernize. And of course, we're seeing it from the you know, technology provider side. And so we you know, sit down with them and this goes back to like my you know, roots dealing with org theory with government organizations and saying, okay, what are all the business units? Which ones are the ones that you're most worried about that are, you know, affecting either top line or bottom line of the PL that you, you know, need to fix? Like, let's look at this from an actual logical financial standpoint. Which of these are, are hurting or could create more growth fastest? And then within that, what are the different problem sets and where do we start? How do we make sure that we have informed stakeholders in these other parts of the organization who we know we might be moving on to help solve problems for next, but let's pick something to focus on. And I think that one of the things we've seen when we work with carriers is you know, there's kind of a, people run away with things and they get really excited and they're like, oh my gosh, let's change the way we do underwriting in like these five different ways and let's, let's also change this customer experience thing and this thing and that thing. And so I think when it comes down to, you know, how do you actually take those, those you know, first steps and, you know, to your point about the speedboats, these, you know, startups that are here, there's this analogy in organizational theory, and this is, you know, I, after mechanical engineering, I wrote a dissertation on uh, innovation in necessarily bureaucratic and hierarchical organizations. So it's like a whole field of study that exists. Um, but the analogy I like to make is, you know, we're not, we are speedboats, right? I actually make the analogy that you're a pirate ship, right? And if you're gonna board a giant aircraft carrier, you can't be coming at it from 90 degrees. You're just gonna like cruise right past it. You have to find, you know, a point in their path where you can actually sail up alongside them figure out here are the things that are currently going on that we can engage with, we can have these other cycles, and then continue to move to other parts of the organization. It's called the like dual cycle model of innovation. There's lots of, lots of literature about it. But that's, that's kind of how I think you start to make a dent in it, because there are so many different problems to, to work on. Anything to add to I'll, that? I'll, I'll say something. I always joke, VCs are, are not so smart, so we oversimplify things. Um, I think generally, what we see with with waves of innovation is the first touch points are the are the ones that people go after are the easier things. So, you know, if you look at wave, we'll call it wave one of InsureTech. A few years ago, you couldn't bind online. You'd go, you'd fill out something online, and then what would happen? You'd have to call somebody, and then you'd have to redo the thing. We just, you know, it was just mentioned the motorcycle insurance and the and the auto insurance at Costco, where the the credit card doesn't doesn't match those seem like fairly easy things, right? So I think you start with the easier things, generally and, and somewhat naturally, and then once those are done, like, is, does it really make sense now to do five more you know, types of uh, UBI companies? We've already got some that are fantastic. We've got you know, next generation kind of home insurance that's using data. So then now, now you start talking about product innovation in gaps in the insurance industry. You start talking about infrastructure layers. You start talking about data pipelines and things like that. I think for me at least, that's where the harder stuff comes and that's the next wave. And then you, you also have to layer in cloud computing has come so far just even in the last five years that some things that we can do today, we couldn't even do five years ago. And so that always enables the next wave 
So I expect five years from now we could be having the same conversation and we probably would have a couple new examples because we've been able to do some things that we can't do today. And I think, I love that, John, and I think the question is, can the, the bureaucracy, can Rachel's next dissertation keep, <laughs> keep up with that? Um, because you ask about what's the toughest thing, and I think it's true for so many of us, the way that personalized personal auto is structured in the United States on a state-by-state -state basis, moving extremely slowly, not attuned to what John just touched on, makes it extremely hard to scale and to scale with that speed and agility that Nigel talked about. And that's the infrastructure that's in place. It's not gonna change anytime soon, we know that. And we have made great advances at Root, but for someone starting today, that's extremely hard. If you're going to start a personal auto carrier today and start to go state by state, you might as well hang it up, honestly, because it's just the, the road that's been paved is not there at the moment. Um, for someone starting up, it's gonna to take too long for the capital that you have. So I think that that infrastructure that exists in insurance is part of the biggest difference with banking, uh, where we obviously have a federal regulator, and it, is, it was much easier for those payment providers and otherwise uh, to accelerate. So banking is very different. The banking is transactional. We'll check our balances on a more regular basis. It's still a digital visualization of a physical statement we got 100 years ago, but it's transactional. It's daily rather than annually, whatever else. My three things were, I think, Rachel, you said be a pirate. Much of you are quoting Dodgeball. Uh, so you want us to be pirates. Biggest um, issues for me, we've got to jettison the legacy. And what I mean by that is the technology. I think my first project 15, 20 years ago was taking out a mainframe and a bunch of other systems. And here we are still talking about mainframes, the things that never go down while well die. Well, they can. McKinsey did a survey a while back saying 13% of insurers are on the cloud today. That means there's a very big number of people that could be leveraging that that are not. I mean, if you want to jettison the legacy mindset, find me an insure tech that takes 12 months to make a really simple decision. We'll wait for that one. Any other questions from the audience? 12 months. So, um, in our industry, there, there seems to be from uh, the carrier to the client, there's a lot of industries in between those that have to do with either claims processing or you know, g you know, finding out the geo site and locations like that. <clears throat> InsureTech seems to have been trying to make uh, those industries' jobs easier as time has gone on. But it seems like we're kind of moving into the switch in that where some of this technology is making the client experience itself better, right? Especially when we talk about Root, being able to use the app and get a better price straight from the carrier and not ha have to necessarily get a better price because the cost of the insurance itself is uh, better. But is there a point in which <clears throat> some of those industries along the way actually make the client's experience better too, especially if they have a really great claims adjuster where they get wiped out completely because of how great of a job InsureTech has done. Um, so I'm just wondering, do we see the client's experience being inside of how we think about some of these different innovations as they come along? And does it just completely, is it only about cost, getting the cost down? If, if, if anyone was here earlier for the panel with the, there were five CEOs up here talking, and I think it was Rick from, from Hippo was talking about how often insurance companies from inside look at how to make their, their operations more efficient. And they say, oh, we're the underwriter, so what, what should we be doing to make our, the underwriting faster, or a little bit better, or let's, let's change the price a little bit to make it a little bit better for the customer. And the, the insure techs and the tech companies are the ones that tend to look at it from the customer experience in and say, what do my customers want and what do my customers need? And I think that mindset is, is coming into play a little bit more. You, made a, you, you said that people would be so blown away by their experience. I think we're a long ways away from that in insurance right now, but it's, uh, you know, it's a goal we should have. I, I'm, I think the question you're asking, which I ask regularly, is who owns the customer of the future? And is it the insurer? Is it the broker agent? Or is it someone completely different? When we buy a new property, are we buying it with insurance built into it? And would we care if it did or didn't? If you drove from New York to Boston, 
with carrier one and drove back with carrier two because it was a cheaper rate and your car decided for you, would you care? Now I'm gonna say we're all of a similar age on the panel, mid thirties ish. <laughs> Insurance is fun, I keep telling people. Um, if, our, if my kids, I've got a 13 year old and a nine year old, if they buy insurance the same way I buy insurance, we have fundamentally failed. And we're not thinking far enough ahead in my mind for that experience, as opposed to worrying about the evolutionary steps we're taking now to be 1% better. It's not wrong what we're doing, but if we moved into Horizon 3 and had some bigger level thinking about what would it like to uh, acquire our insurance automatically because of where we are, what time we are. And I'll give you a great example of it. We had a babysitter come over uh, one evening and she said, will you be home before 11 o'clock at night? I said, well, more than likely. I said, why? And she said, because my car will not let me drive home after 11 p.m. because of the insurance curfew. So using data, using insights, using pricing techniques, we can start to influence these um, behaviors. And I think using all those things, we've got to start asking who owns that customer experience going forward. Part of me says it's not the insurer unless we get our act together. We've got a great opportunity ahead of us. What Nigel's saying is the genesis of our exclusive partnership with Carvana, because Carvana ran a marketplace for auto sales and their consumers weren't reacting to insurance that was uh, brought into that marketplace. They had eight different options, um, but it wasn't easy for the consumer, it wasn't tied in, it asked a lot of the same questions over and over. In doing an integrated, embedded consumer experience and building that over the last year, we have reduced the number of screens for the consumer from 24 down to three. And so it feeds directly into what you're saying. It's harnessing all the pre-filled information that we have, that Carvana has, because the customer has already obviously bought and in, in many cases financed the car from them. And it's a seamless process for the consumer coming directly embedded into the Carvana flow. And it's something that, again, we didn't win that business because we were the biggest brand or the biggest company or the biggest balance sheet or had the most states. We want it because of the technology and because of that consumer experience. So I think, I think John is right that insurtechs come with that mindset. Technology companies uh, of, of the speedboat era come with that mindset. But I think increasing what you're, you're seeing, that daily occurrence or monthly or yearly where you go buy a car and then go to put insurance on that car, uh, is, is consumers want that in a more simplistic way that leverages everything that they've done in the rest of the buying experience. One thing I'll add to all of this is I think that it's not you know, mutually exclusive. You're mentioning like, is the goal to make the underwriter's job easier, or the agent's job easier, or is it to improve the customer experience? Um, a really good example that I have of it being multiple things, and this is where you know, I agree, I think sometimes insurtechs come at it with a fresh view, is you know, we're working with a, a top crop insurer. And for them, you know, these agents have a very personal relationship with the farmers. And so those agents have a really important role to play in the process that, you know, the carrier doesn't necessarily want to cut out or override or disrupt. Yet at the same time, they want to use geospatial data to better understand both, you know, risk for the future of, you know, we have these terrain maps, maybe we can pay the farmer to not plant this area because based on the climate models, we think that there will be floods. So instead we want to incentivize that. So how do they improve the customer experience by better equipping their agents with better data? So I think sometimes you can look at it as, you know, how many different people in the value chain can we affect with this one rollout of new technology? And it could be that there are a lot of different stakeholders. Thank you. And I think we'll end on that note. Thank you guys so much. A round of applause for our panelists.